MJF kicked off Dynamite this week, which means he is officially back. Like a Backstreet Boy. Also, hello, my friends, and welcome to the only review show worth a damn on YouTube. I couldn't even keep a straight face because it's not true. But if you would like the opinions of a bald guy when it comes to sports entertainment and you're into AEW, you've come to the right place. Why not go tell a friend? And if they don't like it, you can go, <laughs> trolled your bum, let's up those downs. Maxwell's also facing Roosh at the start of Dynamite, mostly probably to tell us, hey man, I'm over my shoulder injury and I stand kill go. That was gibberish. He can still go. And he was absolutely correct. It was just a proper start as soon as the bell went with Roosh going crazy. When of course, as soon as MGF got the upper hand, he was doing some strutting, he was doing some grinding. And then as soon as he could, boop. He poked Roosh right in the eye. Roosh then butted him right in the head and Maxwell's lips started to bleed. So that must have been a bit stiffy whiffy. Shouldn't have said that. That sounded absolutely terrible. But he then started to pose, which he shouldn't have done because when he went for the bull horns, he totally missed. Freeman then came back and just spiked this guy right on the top of his head. And then Roosh was really mad because when Friedman ran at him, he just hurled him over the head in a belly to belly suplex. And we had some wrestling tennis. It was then pile driver central because there were a few pile drivers when Roosh got bad at that and he threw MJF into Barry Barricade because as we know when it comes to all wrestlers especially those in All Elite Wrestling nobody respects poor Barry and if I was there I would give him a hug so if you're on the front row of a wrestling show and you see Barry Barricade being assaulted I want you to hug him afterwards and I promise you if someone does do that I'll probably send you a present. He also threw a chair in the ring to distract the referee, but this was his plan, because as soon as the official wasn't looking, Roosh got one of those camera clippings, and he was strangling MJF. So we bring it down, put a one on the camera counter, the crime counter. What is wrong with my mouth today? The point is, you can't do attempted murder. Turn around is fair play, though, so MJF then used that chair and crushed Roosh's face. But Roosh weren't into that, so he grabbed Max and basically threw him to the floor. That did not look fun. Roosh then called for his finish, which was really dumb because it essentially told MJF to get out of the way, which he did. And he hit the heat seeker and a big old brain buster to get the one, two, three. I don't think he's used that move before to get a victory. Maybe it's new. This then got totally crazy because Echi Sarah of all people was hanging out at the gates of agony as he basically laid down a challenge to Maxwell. Oh, I hear the Forbidden Door pay-per-view is coming up and I want your ass. Of course, though, that is the point of the pay-per-view. You're meant to have people from different companies going at it. So it actually does make all the sense in the world. And this was just a very good matchup that had no commercial breaks. Give it up. Brittany McKay was then backstage with Kyle O'Reilly, Orange Cassidy, Don T. Martin, and Mark Briscoe. And I think what had happened here is everybody had enjoyed so much what Mark did last week. They were like, you probably should just do it again. They were totally correct. So Briscoe did just go crazy, and he's an absolute delight. But the best part is when Jack Perry walked in, Mark Briscoe pulled the best facial expression you've ever seen. Just went, get your ass out of here, Jack Perry. I actually think I'm in love with him. I can't do this justice either, so make sure you take a few minutes out of your day to watch it. Kyle O'Reilly and Dr. Martin were so pumped up, whereas Orange Cassidy gave a friendship bracelet to Renee. Wasn't that nice? So yes, please, do make this a weekly thing. You can call it Mark's Manic Minute or a triple M. Honestly, I'm giving it an up. Anything that makes me smile inside my tum-tum, well, the finger goes that way. As we started to get ready for our pay-per-view. Because Will Ospreay and Swerve Strickland both came to the ring as the fans started to be like, oh my gosh, we're going to see it. And because it is wrestling, they had a face-to-face. -face. I do like it, though, because as Excalibur mentioned, hi, these guys are still friends. But Will was a little bit salty about what Swerve had said last week. It was like, you tell me I can't be a world champion. Well, look into my history, pal. I've been a world champion on three different continents. It just means he's the best wrestler on the planet today. Strickland was like, no, you're not. I'm the best wrestler on the planet today. And also, let's go back to your match with Kenny Omega in AEW. Do you remember how you won? I do. You used the Don Callis family. So I bet with me, you're going to do it again. Shots fired. Very timely, we then saw these goons watching on, which was going to tie in. As Osprey was like, listen, bruv, I have defeated Kenny Omega. I've defeated Chris Jericho. I've defeated Takeshita. And I've defeated Brian Danielson. So while you go around saying you have a hit row, I've been walking around with a hit list and I've taken out every one. That was a good line. He then got even better with this because he was like, what if your kill shot you keep going on about misses by a few centimetres? I was like, man, I don't know who came up for that, but that's like superhero stuff. He also ran through all of his moves and promised to hit them all on Swerve Strickland when he was like, maybe I'll even drop you with the Tiger Driver and then you won't wake up at all. 
So we bring it down again. There it is. The crime counter. You can't say stuff like this. If you say that somebody isn't going to wake up, well, it means they're dead. I know I'm a very smart person. Strickland is so damn good though. He laughed this off. It's all like, man, you are talking in what ifs. I know dealing what ifs also. Look at all the friends that you situate around you. Do you know how many friends I've got? Zero, because I've sacrificed them all for this world championship, because that's what you've got to do. And I kind of wanted the camera <laughs> to cut to Prince Nana here. I bet you would have seen his heart break. Like, man, I thought I was your buddy. He didn't threaten to break every single bone in William's body because he'd like to see what Osprey would do then. Because, man, you can do whatever you want to Swerve Strickland, break his bone, shave his head, and he's got to keep on going. He then went back to this idea of sacrifice and said that Will hasn't even sacrificed for his wife and kid. When Osprey was like, man, don't you make this stuff personal. I don't like it. He didn't do this. No, no, they had to get between them because they were about to fight when he also said, whose house? And Will took the mic and went, it's my house, damn it. I mean, didn't say it like that. That would be ridiculous. And even though his music played, Swerve then said, nah, man, cut that music when he said, once again, you don't understand. It is for the world championship. So everything is personal. So why don't you go home and say that to Al and Harry, who, yep, is his wife and kid. Uh -oh. They then really did get in each other's faces. I mean, they were so close, they could have kissed each other. And once again, given that this is good guy versus good guy, they came up with the goods here. This had so much fire to it. And now I want to see the damn match. We also cut to Don Callis after this as Trent flipped out because Will Ospreay is so disrespectful. When Callis was like, don't worry, we've got this. So now I'm starting to think that Osprey will lose because the Callis family screws him over. And if we do do that, we have to tread carefully. But look, at the moment, they're getting everything right. I believe giving it up. When we just got carnage. I mean, my gosh. Because Tony Khan was back booking for the sickos because we did indeed get Orange Cassidy, Mark Briscoe, Kyle O'Reilly and Dante Martin taking on Roderick Strong, Dekeshna, Carl Fletcher and Zack Sabre Jr. who had just turned up. I mean, maybe he was backstage playing Nintendo and they said, bro, come on down. Still don't get why Strong doesn't team with his Undisputed Kingdom boys, although they were right there at ringside and we've talked about it before. And again, as soon as the bell went ding, 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 all of these people went nuts. Apart from Orange Cassidy and Zack Sabre Jr. And this was obvious. I mean, one, Orange is a piece of fruit, so that makes sense. And Zack Sabre Jr. was probably jet lagged. Fletcher then got totally bored of this though, so he murked Orange as he dove onto Mark Briscoe. And I was like, man, here we go, we are cooking. O'Reilly then was kind of trapping Strong's legs, which was interesting, when Mark Briscoe was gonna get a chair. And you know he loves to jump off that thing, but Takeshi knew too, so he just ran him over. Osprey went after him though, when Zack Sapier Jr. was just doing all of his mad submission move hold stuff, which is so damn cool. When Briscoe finally did his jump off the chair, and I was like, good for you, Mark. Good for you. Tilly Dante Martin wanted to usurp him though, because he then did this double jump somersault that actually made me laugh, because he can't be human when Orange Cassidy and Sabre Jr. got into it. And if this was a preview of the pay-per-view, because they are going to have a fight, my word, plug me in. The version of the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up the Zack hit as well, was actually the most devastating. I mean, they were in positions I've never seen before. When Takeshita tagged in and he went and murdered Orange, but then Roderick Strong tagged him himself in, and I tell you, Takeshita was not happy with that. O'Reilly and Roddy then just went at it as Strong killed this man's back, which led to the hot tag to Dante Martin, and he did it again. He was just here, there, and everywhere. When it comes to the flippy dippy doo I tell you, he's very good at this. Fletcher and Takeshita then remembered they were a tag team though, and they murdered him with this avalanche power bomb. But that just brought Mark Briscoe back into the damn squared circle. And I tell you this, he just makes me happy. He went after Takeshita with a froggy boat and a DVD when all the good guys went to the top rope and did a dive, including Horace Cassidy, who did the most lazy, intentionally elbow you've ever seen, and he did the thumb. So once again, my heart goes out to him. It's Titanic. Cassidy they went for the orange punch, but once again, Zack Sabre Jr. was wrapping people up like Prestals when Takeshita just started destroying people's skulls. He's in the G1 this year. I think he could do pretty good. This is when the tag clacks and ha went off and everyone was fighting and Zach got a one 2 ooh after the European clutch. This was so damn nuts, I had to go and lay down. I mean, that's not true, but let's pretend it was. This is when Orange and O'Reilly decided they should team up. So they took out Fletcher when Cassidy looked at Roderick Strong and he gave him the orange punch and he pinned him for the one, two, three. 
I mean, that's sort of revenge. Surprise, surprise, Jack Perry attacked afterwards, probably because he was offended by earlier, and that triggered a big old brawl as everybody ran after everybody else, which meant in the ring we had Orange Cassidy looking at Zack Sabre, and Zack Sabre looking at Orange Cassidy, because in professional wrestling, if you do stare off, it means things are super duper serious. This was just an absolute joy though, and if you are into the quote unquote AEW party match, once again, take 15 minutes today. Up. We've been on a quick video for Mercedes Monet versus Stephanie Vacor, which is going down at the Forbidden Door. We talked about everything that had happened over the last few weeks, and I will sum this up in a few words. I think it should be quite good. We also then found Roosh backstage, who wasn't happy, when a magical hand appeared on his shoulder. We've all been there when we're down in the dumps. We just sit around wishing for a magical hand. What? It turned out to be Don Callis, though, and I think we kind of teased that Roosh may join the family, but Roosh just looked really angry. The thing is, Roosh looks really angry all of the time. I mean, he could probably be eating an ice cream and he'd look upset, but actually in his tootsie toes, he would be really happy. So we'll have to see what happens here. I do not know what we're talking about. When I do think we got the highlight of the night. For it was going to be a title eliminator match between the Young Bucks and the Acclaimed. And as Max Caster was doing his rap, his microphone stopped working. Dun, dun, dun. This is when we cut to the back though, and Akata was sat at the production table, and in the best fake apology voice ever, he was just like, oh no, I pushed the wrong button. I'm so sorry. When he gave it a beat, and just went, bitch. I tell you, I think I die. Now I know some people don't like the AEW version of Okada, which is totally your right. But when it comes to this bald idiot, he makes me so pleased. He is so funny and his delivery is so on point. And this had me howling in my chair that I've got no choice but to give it its own separate up. I've watched it about 10 times because I'm a massive stupid nerd. Turned out this was gonna make Max Caster and Anthony Bowen super serious though, because from the bell, they were whipping the young bucks' ass. And the real issue was, is that Bowen's leg was all taped up because he had a bad hamstring. And man, when Matthew and Nicholas recognized that, they went after it like it was flashing red. Thankfully, he was able to get out of there though, while the young bucks just beat up Max instead. And even though he was able to get the hot tag back to Anthony, when he was rocking and rolling and he hit the fame masser, that was right on his injuries. He was like, oh my leg. I was like, you silly goose. Why didn't you think about this sooner? He was able to dodge the EVP trigger though. But this is when Matt and Nick super kicked his bad leg, which was quite the move when they started pumping up their sneakers because we were going to have a super kick party. Caster wasn't invited though, so he broke this up, which was the first of a lot of good one-two oohs. But even then the Young Bucks got back in control and they were going to hit the TK driver, but Anthony Bowens was like, nah. And he kind of pushed himself into Team of the Turnbuckle, meaning Matthew fell right on his penis. Not Matthew, it would have been Nicholas. The guy that was up there. Matthew was up to his usual shenanigans though, so he was just whamming people in the testicles to get even more one-two oohs. When I swear the Young Bucks did the Motor City Machine Guns finish. Now, I may have made that up, sometimes I am a liar by accident, but does that tie into something? We wait and see. Given that Anthony Bowens kept kicking out though, and given that Max Caster kept interrupting these counts as well, Matthew Jackson then got really annoyed, and he picked up the title belt, and he was going to smash Anthony right in the head. However, Bowens got out of the way, and he almost hit the referee, but I was like, man, I think they planned this because as soon as the ref did turn around, Nick was here with the other title. But Anthony ducked once again, and that's right, brother hit brother, a time as old as tail itself. I got that wrong. This meant amazingly Bowens then did hit the arrival as Max Caster came off the top with the mic drop and they pinged the Young Bucks for the one, two, three. And I was like, oh damn, I didn't see that coming. It was so needed though, because so many of these Eliminator matches just go in the same direction, so they lose the jeopardy. Whereas here, we have brought a little bit of balance back to the force. It also sets up the tag team title match at the pay-per-view, and I presume the Young Bucks will win there. But am I 100% sure now? No, I am not. I thought this was a very good match, and did the world of good when it came to the acclaimed and getting them back on track. But tomorrow and Joe and Hook were then backstage and they were walking to the Premier Athletes locker room because as Samoa Joe told us, man, I'm so tired of these guys, let's just kill them. They did burst in there though when they found the best letter from Mark Sterling because it was written in lawyer speak, essentially telling them, come collision, we want a six man tag. Samoa Joe was like, fine, we'll do it. He also turned to the camera though and basically beckoned them to say something because as it turned out, Shabata was doing the filming and using his translation device, he said, we're going to whip those goofy idiots' asses. I tell you this, when it comes to a team who have become a three, 
Well, they may be my favorites. When we went full on sports entertainment, because we had a contract signing. Now, this was for the Forbidden Door match between Mina Shirakawa and Time to Tony Storm. And given that Mariah May is friends with both of them, she was essentially on hosting duties. She made it clear that she would have love for both of them no matter what, when Mina just went nuts. She was like, ah, Tony Storm. You know, back in stardom, you were a gem, then you came to AEW, and you became a star. And I was like, well, this is weird. Like, you're talking in an insulting voice, but you're being very positive, like this. Man, when we meet in the middle of the ring, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna give you a hug and I'm gonna give you a kiss, because I just love you so much. And in fact, I think you come from great parentage, and if I could be anything like you, man, I would be a happier person. Turned out, though, she did mean it in a bad way, because ever since Storm had become the champion, not only has she gotten soft, she's gotten weak. Here we go. Mina was very really good here though and promised that she will win the championship at the pay-per-view when she signed the contract. When it was Tony Storm's turn to talk and she was really mad. She said to Mina, if you ever raise that voice at me again, I'm gonna slap your tits off. Look, don't blame me. That's what she said and I've been thinking about this. I do believe that is impossible. She then compared herself to a buffet because Shirakawa can come and help herself with a bowl when she too did sign the contract things got a little bit tense. Because as always, it's chin up, tits out, and watch for the shoe. That's from nowhere, Mina went, hey, you, Mariah May, you can't support both of us. You need to choose. I was like, oh my gosh, what direction are we going to go in here? When Harley Cameron and Soraya interrupted. I was like, listen, it's nice to see you, but couldn't you have given us a few more minutes? And he was basically turning into the end of Batman Forever before all of that. And listen, the first thing Soraya did was like, man, I hate you, bitch. So I've got no choice. My back is against the corner, I introduce you to the AEW bitch counter. Now, I'm going to regret this. I don't know why I'm doing it. Of course I'm going to get in trouble, but look, it already moves up to two, and we've only done one show. These guys also have a brand new friend. When Anna J appeared in the ring, she must have teleported in, and everybody started to whoop ass. Actually, I like those three together. I think it's going to work. They even set up a table, but Tony was having none of this. And even though she did have the upper hand, when she went for the hip attack, Soraya got saved by her buddies, which meant Storm went crashing through the wood. And look, Mariah and Mina were watching this from the aisle way. I think that's going to tie it. It also means beforehand we can have a six-person tag, which begs the question, how will they coexist? Which is nonsense, because they're not going to fall into a paradox. They're not going to go into the Phantom Zone. But I actually like this story, and I like the addition of Soraya and her goons. Something about it is just clicking, as far as I'm concerned, up. We then learned what the Owen Hart cut brackets are going to be. Here we go. Because on the men's side, we have Claudio Castagnoli versus Pac, which shall be our main event this evening. Brian Danielson versus Shingo Takagi. Jay White versus Phoenix. And Jeff Jarrett versus a wild card. Never heard of wild card. I wonder if he's good. Over on the women's two, we have Serena Deeb versus Willow Nightingale. Chris Statlander versus Nyla Rose, which will also be on Dynamite. Donna Prazzo versus Hikaru Shida. And of course, Soraya taking on Mariah May. Now, I do have to make a quick detour here because I saw a few people online going, oh man, why is Jeff Jarrett in this thing? So I'm going to do something that I don't usually do, but I feel very strongly about this. Go and flub yourself. Because it takes two minutes to Google this and find out why somebody like Jeff Jarrett would find it very meaningful to be in the Owen Hart Cup tournament, especially given what happened in 1999. Sometimes the human side of wrestling is way more important, but educate yourself, you fools. It would take none of your time. Double J being in this is absolutely a good thing. Right, now let's all calm down and move on. We went right into it after it too because it was Chris Statlander taking on Nyla Rose. And this was like my children fighting because I love them so much, which I shouldn't have said. But I tell you, it was also a damn good match. It also worked perfectly because, of course, this is one of Chris Statlander's first matches as a heel. And Nyla Rose came out to a hero's reaction, so she is now a face. And sometimes things just fall into place and that rhymes, so it must be true. Nyla was using her power to begin with, and even just crushed Chris with this amazing crossbody. That was, I'm gonna smash you 9,000. Statlander must have taken a sneaky med pack too, because all of a sudden she was throwing Nyla into the floor, but Rose was having none of this, and she hit her with this massive clothesline and got the cannonball for a one 2 ooh. And while I could tell Chris was gonna win, I can't lie, I also kind of wanted Nyla Rose to win too. C why can't everybody win? She didn't try for the beast pomp, but Statlander got out of that and hit this amazing kick for a one 2 of her own. I mean, she really whammed her when she went for the 450, but she totally missed. Whoops. That allowed Rose to get another massive elbow for yet another near fall. I was like, man, I'm going crazy here. When I tell you, Chris Statlander cracked her right in the head as they made their way to Tina the Dark Buckle when she dropped her with a tombstone to win. 
That is one of the most impressive things I have seen in 2024. So she does indeed go to the next round of the Owen, but I need this rematch and I need it before, I don't know, summer time has come and gone because they could have easily have taken an extra five minutes and made this even better. So it's definitely getting it up. And again, the women's division right now is cooking. Strongly Hathaway also got a mic after this and threatened Willow Nightingale that she will suffer the same fate as Justin Timberlake if she does keep sticking her nose in Chris's business. And I was like, yep. He said that and there's no going back. Somebody must have told Willow too because she appeared on the big screen and made it very clear when she beats Serena Deeb in the first round. Do you know who she will face in the semi-finals? It's Chris Statland. So that is just a massive round of applause. Sometimes it really is the simple stuff. Private party with then chatting to Renee in the back. And can you believe it? They had learned a thing or two from the learning tree and they're going to use that on their match come collision and Rampage. This is when Chris Jericho walked in and told Isaiah and Mark, listen, when I used to work in Mexico and people wanted to hit me with a power driver, I would just say to them, that doesn't work for me, brother. Man, I laughed. <laughs> he got me. Some people go, man, it's too inside a baseball. What do I care? I'm on the inside. I'm very lucky. Big Bill was also great here too, because he has now adopted the Chris Jericho voice 100%. And I think we're going to do that tag match come the weekend as well. As Brian Keith told everyone, you need to respect Chris Jericho. Look, I get it. It's a divisive gimmick, but it does entertain me. When we continue to heat up Daniel Garcia, because of course he wants Will Ospreay. But he was taking on Rhett Titus, so you knew what was going to happen here. And that's fine. Again, it ties into Dan's story. But essentially, after a minute here with the Impaler DDT, one, two, three. As his usual cheerleader, Matt Menard was on commentary, though. The Gates of Agony decided, <laughs> we're just going to kick your ass. And I tell you, that's what they did. Etsy Sarah was here, too, because, of course, he's hitched his wagon to these guys. And he went after Daniel Garcia. But that meant MGF arrived, because he's now taken on Etsy Sarah at the pay-per-view. So I'm going to watch every single thing you do. He's basically the band, the police. The thing is, though, he didn't do the wrestling mass, so he was outnumbered here. <laughs> when Will Ospreay, for some reason, ran down. And he had the best save attacks I've ever seen. He was just flying around the place. And when him and MJF backed into each other, they turned around, we did the big old face-to-face. -face, and these fans knew everybody went crazy, as did I. Are they going to do this all in? It kind of feels like they might. We also massively crossed the streams here, like the Ghostbusters, because you could do about 10 matches coming out the other end of this segment, and it only went about five minutes, and we continue to tell you that eventually it is going to be Will Ospreay versus Daniel Garcia. I quite enjoyed this. Felt like a mad roller coaster. Ah. Thankfully, Paquette also had my brain, so she found William after this and was like, why did you do that? He said, listen, I don't care about Maxwell Jacob Friedman, but I like my boy Garcia, so somebody had to help and I stood up because he's a baby face and he has friends. He then told Rene to get out of the way because Brian Cage came storming around the corner like he was Godzilla. And essentially, they're going to have that match on collision. But the way that Will Ospreay looked at his title here, I think we're doing an Orange Cassidy type story where Will Ospreay is just putting himself in too many different positions and having too many different fights. So when he does take on Swerve, well, his HP may be near the bottom. Now, I could be totally wrong. I've made that up. But still, Brian Cage versus Will Ospreay will be really, really good. They are going to go out there and go nuts. When we did indeed get to our first men's Owen Hart Cup match and the main event for Dynamite, Claudio Castagnoli versus Pac, these two are just so damn good. Once again, it was like my children fighting. Well, Pac went absolutely crazy at the start of this too until Claudio shut him down with a Sakat uppercut. And given that Brian Daniels on commentary, we then dropped a bomb. He's going to have his match with Hikaki at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view, which makes sense. That also means no commercial breaks. My word, this could be next level. Pac then used his Arkham Asylum knowledge because when Castagnoli charged at him, he got out of the way, meaning Claudio 18 the turnbuckle, when he just did this Hurricane Rana and Acai Moonsault like it was the easiest thing in the world. And even Brian Danielson was like, yeah, that's pretty good. So nobody is smoother than Pac, which is also literally true because he has no hair on his body. When he also hit the most wonderful DDT you'd ever seen, but during all this, yeah, I think Castagnoli had stuck out there and he was trying to fill his MP back up. Because he smashed in with another Street Fighter uppercut when he got back in the big swing and as always Pac sells this as he just flails around I mean it really does look damn devastating I also just think these two have got to be in the running for best wrestlers in the world that people don't talk enough about I tell you that'd be a really weird award show and our next award is indeed for best wrestler from the east coast of America who does a hurricane rana really really good and the nominees are somehow Pac then reversed the Ricola bomb into the brutalizer but then Claudia reversed that into the sharpshooter and when he was done with that he just went into the crossface 
Once again, I was like, how are you doing this? It really was the best math puzzle you've ever seen. And when the submissions didn't work, they just went pink crazy because it was a battle for the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment as we are learning in 2024. If you do the crucifix version, that's the one that works the best. And Pat got Castagnoli in that one, two, three. I think Pat wanted to have some kind of moment of respect with Claudio afters, but he just walked off, which is when Pac looked at Brian Danielson and Brian Danielson looked at Pac because, of course, as we started teasing, if these two do make the semi-finals, they are going to have a match. My gosh, I got excited. I mean, I really do need that more than I need air. <gasps> I was totally wrong. Still, this was a fantastic main event. And I'm giving it up. Which means I'm now going to melt down the internet as well because I've given this show all ups and no downs. But seriously, I actually went through the whole thing twice trying to find something because people do like me to bring balance to the force. But I enjoyed it all. Just think wrestling is great right now. WWE smashed it on Monday. AEW smashing it here. It just feels like a nice time to be a fan. Overall, it gets it up. Now, of course, let me know how wrong I am in the comments below. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. And click the video on the screen, which is ups and downs from Monday Night Raw, so you can hear my reaction to the Wyatt Six. Very excited about that, too. Otherwise, have a great day, my friend. See you soon.